The communist revolutionary, Friedrich Engels, is best known today as the close friend and collaborator of Karl Marx. The academic secondary literature on Engels largely focuses on recounting his eventful life, establishing the extent to which he did or did not differ from Marx's ideas, and evaluating his contributions to Marxist theory. A topic that has largely been ignored by academics is his views on moustaches and beards. David McLennan's Engels does not discuss it at all. Tristan Hunt's Marx's General, The Revolutionary Life of Friedrich Engels, only briefly discusses the fact that Engels took great pride in his moustache as a rebellious youth and beard as a communist adult. Terrell Carver's The Life and Thought of Friedrich Engels, which is the best academic biography of Engels available in English, covers the young Engels' moustache in greater detail, but does not go into sufficient depth. The recent anthology, 200 Years of Friedrich Engels, a critical assessment of his life and scholarship, contains no discussions of Engels' facial hair, let alone a critical assessment. The same is true of The Life, Work and Legacy of Friedrich Engels, Emerging from Marx's Shadow. This gap in the academic literature is a serious weakness. During the course of the 20th century, Engels was transformed into an icon whose beard featured prominently in the artwork and propaganda of governments ruled by self-proclaimed communist parties. A core part of his iconic status as a communist revolutionary is his beard. Nor is it a mere coincidence that Engels' shift from republicanism to communism to Marxist communism coincided with an expansion of facial hair. In this essay, I shall contribute to the growing academic literature on Engels with an overview of what he had to say about moustaches and beards, especially his own. Engels was born at 9pm on the 28th of November 1820 in the Rhineland town of Barmen, which now forms the city of Wuppertal. His father was a capitalist who owned cotton mills. Given this wealthy background, he grew up in a large house and attended school until just before his 17th birthday. Immediately after leaving school, he began working at his father's company in the autumn of 1837. A year later, in the summer of 1838, he was sent by his father to work for the business's export agent, Heinrich Leopold, who was the consul in Bremen for the Kingdom of Saxony. The young Angles suddenly found himself living far away from home and distant from the family connections that had nourished him since his birth. It was during this crucial period of transition, from adolescence to adulthood, that Engels began writing letters to his younger sister Marie, who was born four years after him. In August 1838, Engels wrote a letter to Marie that regaled her with stories of life in Bremen. Topics covered included grapes, apples, chickens, local pigeons, and how women peasants dress. The most significant aspect of this letter, from a historical point of view, is the fact that it is the first letter in which Engels discusses the topic of facial hair. He wrote, This morning a barber came round, and Herr Pastor wanted me to have a shave, for he said I looked quite revolting, but I do not do so. Father said that I should leave my razors locked up until I need them, and he left a fortnight ago today, and my beard certainly cannot have grown so much in that time. And now I shall not shave until I have a moustache as black as a raven. And you know, mother told father to give me a razor to take with me, and father answered that would be tempting me to start shaving, and he would buy me some himself in Manchester. But I don't use them on principle. Engels, in addition to this, informed her that local soldiers on parade lacked the facial hair that he aspired to. He noted, I have just come back from the parade which takes place every day on the Dom Schoff. There the great Hanseatic army, composed of about 40 soldiers and 25 bandsmen, as well as 6 to 8 officers, 
does its exercises, and, if I leave out the drum major, they all have as much moustache between them as one Prussian hussar. Most of them have no beard at all, others just a suspicion of one. Engels continued to send letters to Marie over the following months, but, for reasons that are unclear, did not inform her about moustaches. He most likely talked about moustaches in conversation with friends and colleagues, but these have been lost to the passage of time and made no dent in the historical record. After a two-year period of moustache silence, Engels, who was now 19, once again raised the topic of facial hair in the military. In an August 1840 letter to Marie, he wrote, Soon there'll be big manoeuvres in Falkenberg, three hours from here, where the Bremen, Hamburg, Lübeck and Oldenburg troops, a whole regiment altogether, will show their tricks. They are poor, pathetic things. Three of them together have not as much moustache as I have when I have not had to shave for three days. This letter reveals an important shift in Engels' attitude and development as a thinker. In his previous 1838 letter, he merely described the fact that soldiers lacked good facial hair, but did not place supreme importance on it. Now, soldiers are verbally attacked as poor, pathetic things, because their stubble was inferior to Engels' facial hair after only three days without shaving. This passage appears to reflect Engels' growing self-confidence in his masculine vitality and hair-growing powers. A few months later, in late October, Engels once again felt the need to update his sister on all things moustache. He told her in a letter that, What I wanted to write to you, only you must not write this home, for I want to surprise them with it next spring. I now have an enormous moustache, and shall presently add to it Henry IV and goatee beard. Mother will wonder when suddenly such a long, black beard fellow came across the lawn. Next year, when I go to Italy, I too must look like an Italian. Perhaps most exciting of all is the news that Engels had formed a moustache club with his friends in order to rebel against hegemonic bourgeois notions of appearance. He reported that, Last Sunday we had a moustache evening there for I had sent out a circular to all moustache-capable young men that it was finally time to horrify all Philistines, and that that could not be done better than by wearing moustaches. Everyone with the courage to defy Philistinism and wear a moustache should therefore sign. I had soon collected a dozen moustaches, and then the 25th of October, when our moustaches would be a month old, was fixed as the day for a common moustache jubilee. But I had a shrewd idea what would happen, bought a little moustache wax and took it with me. It was then found that one had a truly very fine, but unfortunately quite white moustache, while another had been instructed by his principal to hack the criminal thing off. Enough. That evening, we had to have at least a few, and those who had none had to paint themselves one. Then I got up and proposed the following toast. Mustaches always were the pride of gallant gentlemen far and wide. Brave soldiers faced their country's foes in brown or black mustachios. So, in these times of martial glory, mustaches are obligatory. Philistines shirk the burden of bristle by shaving their faces as clean as a whistle. We are not Philistines, so we can let our mustachios flourish free. Long life to every Christian who bears his mustaches like a man, and may all Philistines be damned for having mustaches banished and banned. Engels' interest in mustaches was not confined to his youth as a teenager. As a result, it cannot be explained away as the mere product of a young person going through puberty and experiencing the joy and novelty of facial hair for the first time. Shortly after turning 20, Engels wrote another moustache letter to Marie. This letter, which was written in early December 1840, is historically significant because it features a self-portrait that Engels drew of himself 
smoking a cigar with a moustache. The fact that Engels included this picture in his letter in order to show off his moustache can be inferred from the available evidence. He wrote, Now I have had my portrait painted with my moustache so that you can see what I look like. From this picture, it is apparent that, judging by the size of facial hair, Engels is yet to develop his later communist ideas. Although the young Engels viewed growing a moustache as a symbol of rebellion, he also thought that moustaches were valuable due to their intrinsic aesthetic properties and how they altered how other people viewed and treated him, especially women. This can be seen in the next moustache letter Engels wrote to Marie in February 1841. It begins with very alarming moustache news, but soon transforms into a happy story. He told her that, Today, I have shaved my moustache off again, and buried the youthful corpse with much wailing. I look like a woman. It is shameful. And if I had known that, without a moustache, I should look such a sight, I would not have hacked it off. As I stood before the mirror, scissors in hand, and had shorn off the right side, the old man came into the office and had to laugh out loud when he saw me with half a moustache. But now I shall let it grow again, for I cannot show myself anywhere. In the Academy of Singing, I was the only one with a moustache and always used to laugh at the Philistines who could not marvel enough that I had the audacity to go so unshaven into decent society. The ladies, incidentally, liked it very much, and so did the old man. Only last night at the concert, six young dandies stood around me, all in tailcoats and kid gloves, and I stood among them in an ordinary coat and without gloves. The fellows made remarks all evening about me and my bristling upper lip. The best of it is that, three months ago, nobody knew me here, and now all the world does, just because of the moustache. Oh, the Philistines. A month later, in March, Engels's new moustache would have grown substantially. But this did not mean that his moustache-related troubles were over. In a letter to Marie, he shared his profound fear that he may have to shave his moustache off for work. He wrote, For it is now quite certain and sure that the whole Leopold counting house will soon be transformed and have ministers and confidential gentlemen in waiting once again. You will be amazed when you see me with a golden key hanging from my black tail coat. I will, of course, be as stuck up as I have always been, and I'm not cutting off my moustache to please any king, which is the nickname for Heinrich Leopold. It is now in full flower again, and growing, and when I have the pleasure, as I don't doubt I shall, of boozing with you in Mannheim in the spring, you will be amazed at its glory. This letter embodies the inner conflict within the young Engels, between the demands that his bourgeois origins placed upon him and his desire to lead his own life. This conflict would later culminate in him leading a double life as both a respectable member of the bourgeoisie who worked for his family's company in Manchester and a communist revolutionary who plotted to overthrow all forms of class rule. In 1841, Engels had yet to become a communist, but his rebellious attitude can be seen in how he responds to a moment of severe potential workplace adversity. Within this moment of refusal to subordinate himself and his moustache to the will of his boss Leopold, we see the seeds of rebellion that would later grow into the flower of the Manifesto of the Communist Party, which famously declared in 1848 that the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims, they openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. 
The young Engels was not aware of the future that awaited him, and so could not realise that his moustache was the embryo of the beard that would become an icon for the forces of world communism and proletarian revolution. He instead struggled with self-confidence and feared that his moustache was not good enough. In early May, he revealed to Marie that he struggled with the insecurities of youth and shared his most private doubts. He wrote, I might look interesting if, instead of my present young moustache, I still had the one I had in Bremen and my long hair. In the autumn of 1841, Engels moved to Berlin in order to complete a year of military service in the artillery. It is unclear from the available evidence how the forces of militarism affected his moustache. In January 1842, Engels wrote to Marie to tell her how his time in the military was going. He told her that, My uniform, incidentally, is very fine blue with a black collar adorned with two broad yellow stripes, and black. Yellow striped facings, together with red piping round the coattails. Furthermore, the red shoulder straps are edged with white. I assure you, the effect is most impressive, and I'm worthy to be put on show. Because of this the other day, I shamefully embarrassed Rickert, the poet, who is here at present. I sat down right in front of him as he was giving a poetry reading, and the poor fellow was so dazzled by my shining buttons that he quite lost the thread of what he was saying. This letter is noteworthy not only due to Engels's extended description of his buttons. He also included a self-portrait with the accompanying description, Here you see me in uniform with my great coat draped round my shoulders, in a most romantic and picturesque fashion, but strictly against regulations. In this drawing, Engels does have a moustache, and so appears to have escaped what his younger self had regarded as the pathetic fate of shaved soldiers on parade. This drawing is not, however, definitive evidence on the state of his facial hair. It must be critically assessed. A drawing is an artist's representation of reality, I should not be mistaken for the real thing. Engels could have been forced to shave his moustache off by the military, but, as a matter of pride, decided to add it to his drawing for Marie. Whether or not Engels had facial hair during his year of military service in Berlin will remain one of the great mysteries of history. It is rare to find discussions of facial hair in the later writings of Engels. Marx and Engels did discuss beards with one another in a few letters, but it was unfortunately not a main topic of conversation. In an October 1857 letter, Engels informed Marx that their mutual acquaintance, the chartist George Julian Harney, has grown a big, jet-black beard, thereby giving him a strange appearance, in some ways not unlike that of the greasy Jew in the boat that brought us ashore from the steamer. Certainly an improvement. Another beard-related story occurred in 1869. Engels wrote to Marx in late June in order to tell him that Sam Moore, the translator of Capital and the Communist Manifesto into English, has been sentenced to be fed by Tussie at tea this evening, and she plans to give him bread and butter and treacle and to smear the syrup in his beard. Tussie was the nickname for Marx's daughter Eleanor, who was 14 at the time. Engels updated Marx on the greyness of his beard in 1870, and shared similar information with his mother Elizabeth in 1871. A decade later, Marx visited Algeria, which at the time was under French colonial rule, for a few months in 1882. He wrote to Engels in late April in order to share devastating news. He claimed that, Because of the sun, I have done away with my prophet's beard and my crowning glory, but, in deference to my daughters, had myself photographed before offering up my hair on the altar of an Algerian barber. I shall receive the photographs next Sunday. The remark about a prophet's beard could be a reference to an in-joke between the two men. In 1952, they had written an unpublished satire about the German poet 
Gottfried Kinkel. In this pamphlet, they describe him preparing to become famous in London by refraining from all political activity and withdrawing into the seclusion of his home in order to grow a beard, without which no prophet can succeed. In 1890, Engels made the last reference to his beard within his correspondence. In December, he wrote to Victor Adler to tell him that, although Eleanor Marx was correct to note that his beard is curiously lopsided, she was unaware that there are incidentally perfectly good reasons for this, which, however, I shall spare you. Five years later, Engels died, and with him died one of the greatest beards in the history of proletarian socialism. It was, of course, never as great as Marx's beard, and in this respect, like in so many others, Engels lives on in the shadow cast by his friend. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. It was an attempt to combine amusing anecdotes about Engels with me making fun of how some biographers of Marx and Engels write. The worst biographers place huge emphasis on events or texts that were not at all significant, such as discussing whether or not the essay Marx wrote for school contains the seed of historical materialism. So I decided to do the same, but for facial hair, a topic which Engels talks about at length. I've been reading a lot of Marx biographies lately because I'm currently writing a massive video about how Marx became a communist. It will be my longest video yet, and so will take some time to finish. If you like my work, please support me on Patreon. I cannot survive under capitalism without your help. Thanks so much to everyone who has or continues to support me on Patreon. Have a nice day, everyone. Goodbye.